Okay? All right. Now I think you can hear me, right? So uh, welcome to the last talk of the day. Um, so um, it will be a talk where, where the uh, physical uh, security research gets really physical, at parts at least. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, please uh, welcome Matt Smith uh, for the talk. All right, let's try this again, shall we? Hopefully, we're not going to have terrible weather tonight, so we'll see. Okay, so this is about physical vulnerability research and some of the stuff that I've been up to. So I'm going to go through the whole thing again, so it probably makes sense. So if you've heard it before, you know, I'm sorry. So anyway, a bit about me. Um, I'm Matt Smith, otherwise known as Huxley Pig. Um, I've done a lot of social engineering like throughout my life. Uh, I, used to, uh, I used to call it like blagging, getting stuff for free, getting in places for free, and then when I got older, this legitimate term came along. I was like, yes, I'm a social engineer, yeah, great. And uh, it's making, you know, passes, that sort of thing. I don't work for Oxfam. Um, then I got a degree in computer science, software developer, SCADA engineer. And then I became a locksmith, at first the black hat, and then a white hat. And now I make tools. This is uh, Marcella, where I make the tools. Uh, lock fall towers. And um, I look for things I like to call physical O days. So that's exactly what it sounds like. It's an undisclosed vulnerability in a physical system. And now I also help a lot of lock makers improve their designs, um, find problems with the locks. And I've also got a couple of patents for locks I've designed now. So I've if you're like me, you know, you've always loved breaking shit, that's why you're here, right? Uh, one of the first things um, I hacked was Virgin Media to get free, it was nothing great, it was just getting free internet, but that was a lot of fun. Um, locksmithing actually goes back seven generations in my family. Um, my great, great, great granddad um, started it, and um, eventually I fell into the same profession. Um, I never wanted to be a locksmith when I was growing up, by the way. I, I didn't want to do what my parents did, like everyone. Um, I wanted to be a software developer. And then when I actually did it and sat down at a computer for hours and hours and weeks on end, I thought, oh, maybe not. <laughs> maybe I don't want to do this. Um, so yeah, originally I was a black hat and I was um, stealing the money from vending machines, primarily. Um, not the food. The, the money. This is before contactless, so it was all change. So, you know, you could find quite a lot of money in the busy ones. But it's okay, I've changed now. So, no more black hat, it's white hat now. Um, and I shouldn't have to say this, but uh, don't break into vending machines or parking meters. Um, I know a guy who got convicted for breaking into parking meters. He wasn't picking the locks, he was forcing the locks, but he was definitely stealing the money. And um, he got a five-year injunction banning him from going near any parking meter unless it was at an airport and he could do it for a maximum of 10 minutes. And then he couldn't return to the parking meter for a minimum of six hours. And yeah, it could make life difficult, so don't do this. Okay, so I'm going to go through some stuff I've not released before, not publicly at least, and go through some vulnerabilities that I've found and sort of the, how I managed to arrive at where I did and look for sort of common patterns and errors. And this is um, applicable to digital security as well. You get like um, vendors that'll use the same chipsets which have got badly Im implemented stacks or bad pseudo random number generators. And you know, every vendor that uses that chipset, that device will be vulnerable. And yeah, we'll try and apply some sort of prime framework to see if we can expedite it in the future. Uh, I'm not going to be shown any sort of classified stuff um, but if you want to chat to me in the bar later, buy me a beer, we can, we can talk about the fun stuff then. Okay, so, like I say, if you're like me, you think security stuff exists to be broken, right? If it's meant to be secure, we want into it. And um, this goes for lots of people, red, te red teams, pen testers, etc., criminals. And there's an old adage in locksmithing that says locks only keep honest people out. And this is pretty true. If someone wants through your lock badly enough, it's just a matter of resources and time. They'll do it eventually if they want to. It doesn't matter how good your lock is. And I used to think that um, 
if you found problems with things and then reported it back to the people who made it, that they'd fix it. And if, you, if this kept happening, security would generally get better in the world. And I'd, I've since, since I've been in the industry a while, I've learned that that is not the case at all. Um, I don't think things are more secure now than they were when I first started locksmithing. All right, so let's have a look at some physical attacks. So hammers can be used in many different ways. It might sound like a hammer, you just hit something, but you, it's like a um, wire shark or uh, other tools. You can use them for multiple purposes. So this is an example of a lock that's been trounced with a hammer. This, this is like the obvious thing that you do with a hammer. Um, other things you can do uh, include freezing the shackle so um, it becomes shatterable. Or um, if the body of a padlock is made of aluminium or has an, any aluminium in it, you can actually put gallium on there and it'll react with the aluminium and make the aluminium all crumbly. And then you could hit it with a hammer again and get into the lock that way. Uh, spanners are another interesting one. So I don't know if many people have seen this before, but on the cheap locks, you can use two spanners as demonstrated in the picture and just prize into the shackle. And this is an attack on the lock body. The lock body will break. But back to hammers. Many padlocks for convenience, you can just shut them closed. So the good ones have a ball bearing that locks the shackle in place. But the cheaper ones or the most padlocks, you just click and you shut the shackle like that. And so uh, we can make use of that spring. And it's a conservation of momentum attack. So like when one pull ball hits another pull ball, if we can create enough energy into the outside of the lock, then we can, the idea is you can compress that spring and the shackle should just pop open. And uh, I can show you this in action. So here, here's a couple of master padlocks. I'm just demonstrating here that they're, they are locked. And that's hit it with a hammer one, hit it with a hammer two, just pops open. And you can do this on lots and lots of uh, locks. It's only a question really of how much energy you can get into the body of the padlock. Uh, this is the story of the first vulnerability that I ever found in a lock. So a long time ago, about 1998, when, when I were a lad, me and my friends uh, used to go over Canic Chase in my mate's Jeep. He had one of these Jeeps and he was obsessed with taking it into the places you shouldn't go. Uh, Canic Chase, if you don't know, is uh, like, like here. It's, like, it's just a wood with hills and forest. And um, we couldn't get to the cool bits. We couldn't get to the really cool bits because there's ditches and there's locked barriers. And the lock on the barrier was this. I actually found this in, um, in the street and I, I was driving past and I was like, shit, I know that lock. I need to get that lock because that's the one that's on the barriers at Canic Chase. So anyway, I got this lock and thought, well, oh, th this is the reasons they use it, right? It's weatherproof. Um, it has to be if it's in the forest. And uh, it's secure because it says so on, on, the, on the front of the lock there. So it must be. So I didn't know uh, how to pick lever locks at the time. I sort of knew how they worked, but I didn't know how to pick them. So I thought, let's break open the lock, see what I can find inside. And at the time, I didn't have a workshop or even a vice. Um, so I used a, a hammer again and uh, a wood chisel. It's not even a metal chisel, it's a wood chisel. And I took it outside onto the pavements and just went at it until I broke it open. And I, this, this is what it looks like today. And when I got it open, I noticed that those little spiky bit circles are the bits that the key contacts. And those little lumps on the left are the bits that need to be lifted so that the shackle can open. Now, this is an example of a good lever lock. And a good lever lock has circle at the bottom there there's a physical barrier to stop you lifting the levers too high. And that's not the case on this lock. So I use like a two-part attack, um, one part to tension the bolt thrower, and basically just a blank that goes up and pushes all four levers at once. And you can see here at the side, the levers have been lifted clear of 
the blocking part, so the lock can open. And the good thing is with this as well, you can lock it back up again, and it, no, no one's ever known that you've, you've been there. And that led to a lot of fun over Canet Chase in the Jeep. We, all, we almost died several times. I'm surprised I'm still here to tell the tale. This is another lock that I've spent a long time working on. Abloy Classic, it's been around for a very long time. Uh, 1896, I think, Abloy invented this lock. And it went unpicked for years. And then in the 70s, uh, a guy called Seppi Turvenen, um, a Finnish sex pest, he used to pick the locks on, th pick this lock um, on women's doors, and let himself in, and then he'd hide under the bed, and then at some point in the night he'd come out and attack them like some sort of scary bogeyman. And the Finnish police didn't think that he could actually pick the lock because this was the first example of this lock ever being picked in the field. Before this, Abloy offered yeah, a million Finn marks reward if anyone could pick the lock, um, but obviously they scrapped that after this. So what they did, Abloy changed the design of the lock. Um, the tool this guy was using, the Vempele, uh, it's Finnish thingamajig or what do you call it, you know, it's, it's got some, some Finnish name. And they changed the design so this tool didn't work anymore. And then this was um, about 1978, I think. And since then, again, since they changed the design, allegedly, it went unpicked. And in a nutshell, here's the problem with trying to pick this lock. You need 90 degrees of movement on your lock picking tool. And you can see there's a gap there of 90 degrees. So you might think, OK, you've got 90 degrees. You need 90 degrees movement. What's the problem? Well, the problem is your lock picking tool has to exist within that 90 degrees as well. So if you go 90 degrees one way, you're going to upset the furthermost disc. And if you put the tool on the other side and go 90 degrees the other way, you're going to upset the other disc. So again, I took it apart and studied it for a long time and um, found out that you can actually get away with dislodging the discs a little bit. And that's because in the bottom picture, that like little steel bit at the top, that's the sidebar, that's what prevents the lock from opening. And it has to sit in that little U shape at the top of the disc. And if you dislodge, you can see it's not perfectly aligned, so if it's dislodged a little bit and you tension the lock, that sidebar will push down into that U shape and end up pulling the disc back around like by itself. So you can get away with a little bit, so that led to me thinking, okay, so maybe I, maybe I can do this. Maybe we can exploit this. And like I say, everyone in locksmithing said, this lock can't be picked. Um, it's not possible. No one's done it. So it's like a red rag tool, but I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. It doesn't matter how long it takes. I'm doing this. So about six years of work, off and on, uh, design after design, didn't work, didn't work. And then I realized the design that I wanted to use was difficult to make. So I had to save up to buy a milling machine and make this very fine, thin, delicate part. Anyway, long story short, it worked. I managed to make a tool that picked this lock. Um, and then three, four weeks later, a friend rings me up and says, oh, your tool, it's really cool, it's for sale on that locksmithing website. Well, no, I don't know anything about this. So I went to the website and I see pretty much the same design of my tool there. So I contacted the website owner and he said, uh, oh, okay, so yeah, the government have been using this tool for like eight years, um, only it's been restricted and it's not publicly available so no one knows about it. And now you've done a design that's pretty much identical, we can de-restrict it and sell it publicly now. <laughs> oh, fuck. Okay. So um, I don't want to invent things that have already been done. If I'd have known this tool existed already, I wouldn't have spent so much time and effort and money doing it. Um, so yeah, it, it, was, it was quite a kick in the balls, but I decided, I'll tell you what then, I'm going to use what I've learned and make the tool better. And so this is the tool in action. You don't get to see it. The, the tool itself is restricted. <laughs> but um, this is the improved version of the tool that I made. And it's, it's a terrible video. It was, it was a while ago. But anyway, the tool's in the lot now. And I'm not really picking it. It's a self-impression in attack. So I'm just, I'm just jiggling the tool, basically. And that's it. 13 seconds it took to open that lock with the improved tool. And that's, that's a lock that's meant to be unpickable. This is another one of my favorite locks, uh, Ever MCS. It's a magnetic lock. 
Um, it was developed in Vienna, Austria. And again, this lock went unpicked for a very long time because you can't physically access the internals of it because it's all magnetic. And I've spent more time on this lock, I think, than any other lock. So this is how it works. You can see each of these wheels has got like a little pie slice cut out of it. And they all have to line up like in the picture. And there's a blocking element that will go into the pie slices and allow the lock to open. And it's that times two on both sides of the lock. And you can never know what position these little pie slices are in from outside the lock. So ostensibly, it's impossible to open. And then oh, maybe 20 years ago, I got an email from um, a German friend. And he said, in the MCS, those, uh, those rotors, they're quite noisy. Uh, I was thinking, you know what? Yeah, they are quite noisy. So I thought, well, maybe we can leverage the noise thing, see if we can open the lock. So using like a guitar pickup, you don't have to use a guitar pickup, by the way. You can hear it, but this, this aids it to a massive degree. So using a guitar pickup, you can tell which wheel is incorrect. So you can't tell which one's right, but you can tell when it's wrong. So if something's wrong and you change it, and it's still wrong and you change it, and all of a sudden it's right, and another one's wrong, you repeat this process until everything's right, and then the lock opens. So you've got 2.2 millimeters of space to work with in this lock, so making something that simulated the key was very difficult. Um, this is four failed designs. The one in the top left is um, just magnets superglued to a bit of metal. That didn't work. The other one's like fiddly little magnets you push into holes. I mean, it sort of worked, but it was, it was fiddly. And yeah, anyway, th none of these work. But eventually, I managed to simulate how the original key worked. Now, you can't, you can't copy how Ever have made their keys. They've magnetized the magnets in. Um, they've patented the process they used to magnetize the magnets. But using two magnets on each side, you can simulate the key, which is exactly what I've done here. Uh, but this, this only was the start. You then had to, I then had to work on the technique to narrow it down. But um, eventually, yeah, I got to the point where I can open the MCS lock as well. I don't know if anyone knows this lock. Um, again, another unpickable lock. Bowley, they've not been around long, uh, bless them. They have tried their hardest to make a lock that's unpickable. And I, I guess it's a good idea on the face of it. This is the key for the Bowley. And you can see you've got this funny U shape in it. And that bit missing in the middle, that goes around like a metal shield. So that if you want to try and pick this lock, your lock picks have to go around that U shape and also manipulate the five pins. And because there's only maybe two millimeters of gap at the end, you physically don't have the space to pick the lock. So if traditional lock picks won't work, then that's a win, right? They've made an unpickable lock. Well, no, not at all. I've got a video of me opening this lock. That one? Yeah. So we'll skip forward a little. So what I'm using here is, um, again, it's another conservation of momentum attack. Um, so I don't know if you know how key bumping works, but basically um, what you do, you hit all of the bottom pins simultaneously, and the top pins then absorb the energy and fly up away from the bottom pins, creating a big gap between the two. And if you time it right, you can open the lock while that gap exists. That's what I'm doing here, only this is an EPG, it's an electric pit gun. So it does that, but just really fast. It's not a drill. People sometimes think it's a drill, it's not a drill. So that's vibrating the pins now. And that's it, the lock's open at this point. So this unpickable lock. I used to say, uh, I can open this lock with a paper clip, and people used to laugh at me. And I'm well, actually, it's perfectly possible that that's the back spinning just to prove it's open. And yeah, like you see, it's very effective and very fast. This is another um, one of my pet locks, if you like. Um, I went through the chain of Abloy locks, and this is like their current top of the range lock, Abloy Protect 2, it is now. It uses um, a disc blocking system. So the idea is that if the discs are jammed in place, then 
If you try and manipulate them, you can't because they're physically unmovable. What I did was I looked at the differences between ProTec 1 and ProTec 2 and had a look at what they'd changed between the two versions, which gave me a lot of hints as to what the problems with the ProTec 1 might have been, because otherwise they wouldn't have changed things, right? And actually, the ProTec 2, some of the new changes they made introduced new problems. So, And this happens again with digital security all the time. So I broke it down in stages how I can open this lock, They're like chaining vulnerabilities. So originally I bypassed the DBS, that's the disk blocking system, with a piece of wire, which can be seen here. Uh, and since then I found quite a few ways to do it, but originally I did it like this. So the two bars on either side of the lock have to meet and come together and sort of slip down at one under the other. And that piece of wire allows them to meet, but it doesn't allow them to physically slip down into the grooves and block the disks. So that was the first stage, bypass the disk blocking system. Even then, you still have to manipulate the lock, which is very difficult in itself, but at least now the blocking system is neutralized, at least it's possible. Um, the, my current ProTec 2 tools are restricted, so I can't show those, but uh, we, can, we can open the ProTec 2 as well. Um, it, it's in a folder, it's in the folder full of NDAs. I've got loads of NDAs from different lock companies and tool makers and that sort of things. This one's kind of fun. Kensington laptop lock. This is used to uh, secure digital IT infrastructure. And I thought, again, it's got um, a sprung shackle on the bottom, so you can just push the wire in for convenience, and it's locked. And I thought, so I'm going to try the same thing on this lock. I'm going to try and bounce those springs back. So uh, I got a hammer again, and uh, I was only tapping it. I swear to God, I was only tapping it gently, and it, and it just fell off. And I was like, whoa, sure, surely that isn't right. Um, and what's happened with this um, is when you, when you hit it, there's a part inside that deforms and it allows the shutters to still work. So you can still come back and put the lock on and it, you can still use the key and the user would never know there was a problem with it. But yeah, it's, it's very, very, uh, very shit. And it was accidental, like I say. A lot of um, disco best discoveries are, are the accidental ones, right? I wasn't even trying to do this to this lock. All right, let's have a look at some digital stuff now. So I don't know if anyone's got ring doorbells. I mean, I know I've got one, and they're, they're pretty useless, right? I think the sold's like a security device, but I mean, pff, they're, not, they're not right. Um, so the problem with these is in order to see who's at your front door, it has to make uh, essentially a, a VoIP call. There's no local recording on the device. So if comms drops, then you don't know there's anyone at your door. And worse, when the comms comes back up, if someone has been at your door, again, you don't know, it doesn't give you any sort of indication that there's been someone there. I believe the Ring Alarm Pro actually has a little SD card that records locally on it, so that's better, that is better. So how could we attack this? Well, if you cut the power to the place, then comms are going to go down. I mean, that's pretty noisy. It doesn't have to be destructive if you've got access to the breaker. But again, the phone line, if you've got the phone line, comms are going to be down. Uh, and like if you've got access to the signal box, again, it's not necessarily destructive. Um, you can jam the wireless, which uh, again is a bit better, I guess, but you risk jamming other stuff. But uh, what you can do is using Wireshark is sniff the MAC address and just deauth it off the network. And if you, if you just keep deauthing it off the network, then the owner of the ring doorbell never knows, you, doesn't know anything's happening. And uh, yeah, that's very targeted, very clean. That's, that's probably the best way to do it, I think. And yeah, like I say, when it connects back to the network, it's as if nothing's happened. The user would never know you'd been there. There's a trade-off between convenience and security, always, and this is one of those. So people are getting wireless alarms fitted a lot um, because it's more convenient than drilling holes and laying cables. And they've got exactly the same problems as the ring doorbell. So again, any sort of connectivity loss, and it's a problem. So um, you can sniff the MAC address of a particular wireless sensor, and again, you can deal with them off the network. You can jam them. Um, one of the cool things you can do is if you know the protocol, um, you can talk to the base station and m 
make out that the signal isn't an alarm when really it is. The better alarm systems won't let you get away with this because they will pull back regularly to either from the sensor to the base station or from the base station to whoever might be supervising the alarm. Um, but how long do you actually need to get... If, if you've opened a door already, then maybe you only need three or four seconds, five seconds maybe, to open and shut that door again. And physical access is always king. If you can get to a system physically, then you own it. So I, I much preferred wired alarm systems. Often you have redundant comms, so you've got the phone line and then there'll be like a 5G connection as well. And again, if you, if you were to jam the 5G and put the phone line, the better systems will poll back to whoever's supervising the alarm and say, yeah, it's gone offline, put it into alarm. And again, attack vectors for this. So you can target individual sensors for wired alarm systems. If you can get physical access to something, you've got it, right? Another thing you could do is protocol reversal. Uh, again, so if you've got physical access to some of the wires, um, I know someone who's done this, in fact. Um, if you can get an access point into the network, then you can spoof whatever you want to the base station. And a lot of sensors have got blind spots as well. Bad, badly installed alarm systems are everywhere. And you can socially engineer your way in. There's, lo there's lots of ways. Th these read sensors are on the doors of alarm systems. I'm sure you've seen these everywhere. Now, there's um, a few ways you can get to these. They're normally, normally it's normally closed in, with a magnet that keeps it from going into alarm. So if you don't know, if you, let's say you're on the outside of a door and you don't know the position of an alarm sensor, you can sense for that magnet using a hall sensor. And that'll tell you where the switches, the weather sensor is. And so if you then know where it is, you can then simulate that magnet on the outside of the door, so long as the magnet's sufficiently powerful enough. Or even better, if there's a gap in the door, and I've done this, if there's a gap in the door, you can feed a little magnet through and simulate the magnet on the door. And then obviously you keep the magnet there and open the door and the sensor doesn't know anything's happened. If you've got physical access, then you can permanently trick it using like a little little round magnet. You can tape, tape a magnet to the sensor. And because you're doing that when the alarm isn't activated, when it is activated, that magnet's permanently there then. So again, you can open and close the door and that magnet is tricking the sensor into thinking nothing's happened. These are fun too. Um, dual passive infrared and microwave. So in order to get these to go into alarm, both parts have to be tripped, both the microwave and the infrared. And there's three lights on there. There's like a green, an amber, and a red. And green means not a problem. Amber means one of the two has been tripped. And if it goes red, then both of the two have been tripped. And then it goes into alarm. I don't know if any, has anyone else done this? I might, this might be weird, but sometimes I go into shops and um, you'll see these sensors. And obviously the alarm's not activated, but the sensor's still active. And so you can walk around the room and see how sensitive the alarm is and where the blind spots are. So if you walk to the edge of the room and all of a sudden it stops going orange or red, you know, OK, so there's, there's the line of... That's, how, that's where the sensor can see to. And I, I do that quite a lot. The infrared part is the easiest part to trick on these because um, it, it just sees heat. It sees changes in heat. Um, so if you can get some sort of room temperature shield, if you, if you were to enter a room that has one of these and, and you have a shield in front of you that is the same temperature as everything else, then the alarm's not going to see and it can be something as simple as like just cardboard. Something really simple. Um, if you can get physical access to it while it's not alarmed, then um, again, physical access is king. They did this in the Antwerp Diamond House. They spread, and there's a whole talk about the Antwerp Diamond House. It's absolutely brilliant, but... They had, um, they'd rented out safety deposit boxes in the vault. And so when they were in the vault, ostensibly going about the regular work, they sprayed um, hairspray or latex onto the sensor while it wasn't in alarm. And then later on when they came back, the alarm was blind, the sensor was blinded so because they'd already sprayed it and it couldn't see them there. 
another trick I've heard people say you can do is turn the heating up to body temperature. So if you walk in, it doesn't see your body temperature, but I, I don't know how feasible that is. And if all else fails, you can trick them by walking really slowly. But if you're, if you're in a situation that sort of isn't conducive to that, it's, prob it's probably a bad idea. Uh, bad installation of alarm systems, again, is, is really common. They'll miss places, they'll, the CCTV, the sensors will have blind spots. A lot of the old cameras, um, you can blind them with lasers or infrared. And if there's a wire exposed from the outside, like, like in this picture, then again, if you can get into the network, then you can um, inject protocols into it. There's a really cool talk. Um, hold on, I've written it down. Yeah, exploiting network surveillance like a Hollywood hacker. It's a DEF CON talk from a while ago, and they did exactly that. They reverse engineered the protocol, and um, they, in the end, they could inject whatever they wanted into the CCTV feed, like uh, text, video, whatever. That they totally, totally own the CCTV. Uh, Babak Javadi and Keith Hell have done some good stuff on this as well, if you want to look those guys up. Something else you can do is um, deliberately trip an alarm over and over again, so you can see what the response time is and the response strength is. Um, and often, if you keep doing it over and over again, whoever is in charge of the alarm system is just going to get annoyed and take, take the sensor out of the system, and that, that's the idea sometimes. Or you can do what I said with the read sensor earlier, but deliberately get the magnet wrong and trip the alarm from the outside of the door and do the same sort of thing. Same with vibra vibration sensors and floors or fences. And yeah, like I say, you can use it to sort of socially engineer the re response. Right, access control. A lot of these um, are vulnerable to um, a magnetic attack. So they've got relays in them. And um, often as well, these are on the outside of buildings, but they'll put really bad screws in them, like security screws. But you know, if you have the right screwdriver, you can just get into there. And again, if you've got physical access to it, then you're in. You can use it to sniff creds. You can jump the contacts inside of the box to open it. And again, you can do protocol injection with this stuff too. Um, smart locks uh, are quite an interesting one. These are like getting popular now. Um, the problem with these is a lot of them were designed by electronics engineers, not people who are well versed in physical security. Um, so even if the digital side of it is secure, then you can still manipulate or bypass the locks. Uh, a lot of these can be bypassed using um, a hammer drill. Not a hammer drill. Hammer drill, is it? Reciprocating drill. And um, you can bump the solenoid in the middle. And lots of manufacturers copy the design of each other. And so these vulnerabilities are present in all of them. So yeah, like I say, um, you can open them often from, there's a solenoid in the middle, so when you come along with your card or your phone or whatever and open it, and it authenticates, this little solenoid moves back, but it's often on a spring, and we can do the same thing I was talking about earlier with a spring, and we can hit the outside of the lock, compress that spring from the outside, and then open the lock. And the thing about this is, there's normally an audit trail, selling you who's been and when they've been there, but this totally bypasses any sort of audit trail. And yeah, the, you put a 3D printed head adapter on it and use a hammer drill. Um, and that's just the physical side of it. I mean, there are a lot of really bad smart locks where you can, the, there are keys in clear text going over the Wi-Fi and predictable rolling codes, replay attacks. I mean, the, they've been littered with problems since their invention. Uh, routers, so I mean routers are, are pretty bad anyway, right? For a long time you've been able to get onto them using default admin. I mean WEP, WEP was useless. Um, there was brute force in the pin. I mean that's that's better now, but uh, again that that was something that was pretty easy to do. Um, there was an old Virgin box where you'd start it up, and it had, the Wi-Fi would come up open, and then it'd go back down again and come back up WPA2. But if you could get onto it while it was open, then again, you could use the default creds and 
own the box. Uh, I spoke about this briefly earlier, Virgin, uh, Doxis One. I mean, we're going back a while, but uh, yeah, you could sniff the MAC addresses and swap them with each other and end up getting free Virgin internet. And this is a common one. What, default wireless passwords derived from the MAC address. Uh, British Telecom made this mistake, and uh, loads and loads of their routers could um, you could derive the password. All right, so briefly, let's have a look at some methodologies. So this guy, Daniel Heiss, um, he was convicted in Australia for murdering a guy. Him and his friend wanted his guns. And so he got sent to Berrymore Prison. And when he got there, he found a fellow inmate who'd got um, sort of privileged status. And he was a jeweler on the outside, so he'd been given access to jewelry making equipment. And he said, OK, they got together and said, let's make a key. Let's make a key and we can get out. And they could have tried to view the key as the wardens were using it. But where they actually got the key from is much better than that. So when you first go to Berrymar Prison, they gave you like um, a booklet saying, you know, welcome to the prison, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. And on the front cover of the brochure were the master keys to the prison. <laughs> and so he, he just copied those and they escaped. Um, he left a cheesy message saying, this bird has flown on his cell. Uh, it, Baker, the jeweller, 24 hours he got recaptured and hoist 12 days. And then he got out and started making terrible art. And, and now he's back in prison again for parole violation. But the point of this story is observation. You, if, you, you, if you look hard enough, you, you, can, you can see some pretty cool stuff. So photos of keys. Um, there's now a machine. This is an easy entry machine. Um, it'll copy like the profile of a key, any key. Well, nearly any key. Um, but there's actually systems now that'll take long range photographs of a key and automatically decode the bitting and then automatically cut the key. So observation can be really useful. And don't put photos online either. That, this mistake happens quite a lot, like here. So um, SS Dev, the guys um, who are doing the lock picking village, um, the Dutch police had these new high security handcuffs, and the, the, the lock on them was good. It wasn't like generic handcuffs where one key will open pretty much all of them. The, these were good handcuffs. It was a Chubb 3 lever lock. Anyway, they put images of it online, and um, so the guys at SS Dev saw it, copied the, copied the key, and this 3D printed key will now open these high security Dutch handcuffs. Um, this is something else I've done quite a lot, sports events. Um, if you watch TV at sports events, you can get a lot of useful information. So these are all passes that I've managed to grab off TV and Twitter feeds and that sort of thing. And I mean, the, once you see them, they're really easy to copy. You can get in. Um, this is one on a dog. I don't know if the dog actually had a legitimate pass, but this is a legitimate format of pass. So yeah, just copy this. And I've done this. I did this at the World Cup in 2006, actually in Germany. Uh, Premier League, cricket, music festivals. Copying passes is a, a really, really easy way to get into places. Another way we can um, try and find out some vulnerabilities in stuff is look at what's been changed in the new version to the old version. So revision notes do this a lot in software. They'll say, yeah, we fixed this and this. And they go, OK, so if you look at it, you know that oh, that used to be a problem and that used to be a problem. And so if you ever find an old version of that software, you know for a fact that it's got X, Y, and Z wrong with it. Huh? Uh, and I, like I say, this applies to physical and digital security. I did it with um, the ProTech. And if ever they change something, look at what they've changed. OK, so probably the best way to go about finding vulnerabilities in stuff is like what I did earlier, you know, methodically break down the system, look at every part of it, see if you can find a hole, and exploit the hole. Um, and like I say, you get common designs from one manufacturer to another. Um, decapping PSUs and electromagnetic microscope scanning so you can see exactly what's going on in stuff. Uh, and fuzzing is another one, so just throwing stuff at it, right? And if something sticks, you don't really need to know how it works. If it works, it works. And accidental discoveries, a lot of fun that 
some of my best discoveries have been accidental discoveries. And then try and look at ways in which a system can leak information. So um, like cryptographic wait times, um, I use the, s the sound I mentioned earlier. Um, you can measure the rotation of a lock or um, the arm on a safe to know how close you are to open it. There's lots of ways systems can leak information that whoever designed them didn't intend them to. And be inventive, look for unconventional attack vectors. And I'm, I'm a big fan of this last one. As soon as you've found a way to do something, try and find another way to do it. And then try and find another way to do it. Find as many solutions to the same problem as you can. So you've got some sort of redundancy. And the concepts between digital security and physical security, they're the same. But once you've found a problem, you have to ask yourself, is it practical? So just because something's feasible doesn't mean it's practical. So physical keys, I could have like a thousand, ten thousand keys to a lock. And I mean, it's feasible for me to try every key and one of them will eventually open it, but it's not practical. And it's like brute forcing passwords. If a password is sufficiently strong enough, then it might take 10,000 years and yet it's feasible, but it's not practical. So you have to ask yourself, just because you've found a problem, can I actually es exploit it? And don't forget that every, every security system ever invented was designed by people. People no smarter than you or me, and people always miss stuff. So remember, nothing's ever perfect. If ever you get a more complex system, often that leaves a larger attack surface, so you can find more problems if something's been made more complicated. And like I say, they're just people. People miss things, and they can't see the future. They can't see what's going to happen, like so um, safes in the past. Uh, were very secure, they were very burglar-proof, and then x-rays came along, and they, they, they didn't know what x-rays were when they invented the safe, and all of a sudden you could get into the safe. And the good safes nowadays actually have x-ray protection on them, so you can't do that. And, and yeah, ne another one, never give up until you've done it, until you've broken it, keep going. So yeah, I've only just scratched the surface of the subject. I could do this talk again and replace everything I've just said with other examples. There's so much to go into. Other people's stuff, historical biggies. And yeah, a lot of the stuff that I can't disclose as well. And I think the bottom line here is if I can do it, anyone can do it. You know, just go and find some cool shit and break it. And that's it, we're done. So yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the, the talk, Matt. Um, we are going to have like uh, three minutes for, for questions. So um, uh, if you can line up here uh, for, for questions, it would be great. I don't think that's working. Is this working? Oh, yeah, maybe it is, maybe it is. Perfect. <laughs> um, any questions? I cannot see. Do we have a Q&A mic there? Okay. So um, uh, let's give a last big huge applause to Matt. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>